So now that we've talked about the base stuff, let's go back to joins and talk about the different types of joins. We have three basic join types that we're going to go after, and there are versions of each of these, and we'll talk about them. The first type is a nested loop join. The nested loop join is the join that we've been using uh, for ever, uh, ever since the beginning of SQL Server. That is the default join approach that the SQL Server uses if it has matching indexes and it doesn't have anything else. The second type of join is called a merge join. A merge join is a good thing. A merge join happens and all the stars are aligned. We have, rather than a nested loop, uh, get me all the rows from B for the first row in A, now get me all the rows in B for the second row in A, get me all the rows in B for the third row in A. What we're going to do instead is say we have sorted result sets. What we're going to do here is get the row from A, take the matching row from B, uh, as I walk down B, I stop matching A, now I join from B to A, and I go back and forth effectively. This is extremely efficient. Uh, it is a relatively new trick. I believe it came about in SQL 2005. Final join type is a hash join. A hash join is a red flag. The hash join says, I do not have a matching index or a good approach to resolving the join." What I need to do is punt. If you see a hash join between two tables, you are missing an index. Plain and simple, there's an index missing. Now, you will occasionally see hash joins in your plan that are beyond your control. For example, if you have two intermediate result sets that are joining together, for example, you have two group buys and you're joining the results of the group buys. Well, the group buys are going to create uh, uh, memory only hash, uh, memory only uh, tables. Uh, they're going to be joined together and there are no matching indexes, so you're using the hash join. So hash join is not always indicative of something you've got to fix or change, but it should be a red flag and something you investigate about 100% of the time. So, most common way of resolving the joins is the nested loop, otherwise known as a nested iteration join. What the server does is create the nested loops. Here's an example. We're joining the authors table to the title author table on the author ID. And the pseudocode looks kind of like this. We grab the first row of authors. While not EOF title author, we read the next row of title authors. So we grab the row from the authors table and we bring back all the matching rows from the title authors table. When we've done that, we get the next row from the authors table. This is your nested loop join. Note that we can do this in either direction. We can say, well, not EOF title author, join it to all the authors table. The decision which direction to go in comes out of our histogram. In this example, we're doing the select from title uh, authors to title author. Uh, for those of you who are not accustomed to looking at query plans, we are seeing that we're going to be joining from the authors table to the title author table. We are doing a nested loop join. Note that the cost of the nested loop is trivial. And then we bring back the rows. Note that the clustered index scan is kind of the same as a table scan. And this situation is identical to the table scan. And a clustered index seek is a good thing. Uh, one more red flag to look out for as we're looking at joins. An index seek is a good thing. It means we are using the B tree to start at the root page, identify the row, bring back the row. An index scan may be a bad thing. An index scan says, I'm doing a table scan, but not of the table of the index. It's scanning the entire index, as opposed to using the structure. Now, we don't have a where clause in this query uh, other than the join clause, so we want the whole thing. So we're going to have to do a scan of one of the tables. And it, in this case, it shows authors. Now, we talked about the fact that we're going to quantify the cost of that nested loop join. We're doing that here. The nested loop join is going to be 
uh, the cost of joining the two tables together. So here's what happens. What we need to do is read all the matching rows in to table one. When we've read all the matching rows from ta uh, table one, for each of those rows, we need to bring in all the corresponding rows for table two. So how does that actually work? Well, what we're going to do is uh, line the tables up, bring back the table one, bring back the first page. Uh, for each of the rows on that page, we're going to say bring back all the matching rows in table two. So on a good day, we have the row from table one. Then we're going to go over to table two and say, bring me all the matching rows back. On a good day, we've got uh, an index on that, which will make that quick. On a great day, we're going to have a clustered index on that. We may have all those rows on a single page or uh, tightly, uh, or tightly bound, uh, tightly integrated into a couple of pages, which are chained together. On a not as great day, uh, we'll have a non-clustered index, and our 50 requests will bring back 50 pages instead of the whole 10,000 pages. In this example, which we're going to quantify, uh, we're seeing just some numbers to associate. But here's how it works. What we need to do is, for each of the rows in the outer table, uh, we need to take all the matching rows and then read all the corresponding pages in the inner. So, rows in the outer. Uh, so we have 50, sorry, 53 pages, pages in the outer, 53, uh, plus the number of rows matching the outer, which is 1,000, times the number of potential matching pages in the inner, which is 16,667. So joining from table 1 to table 2, we've got about 16 million page requests. It says IOs, not necessarily physical IOs. And, of course, these are worst-case situations and not necessarily exactly what we're going to hit. The optimizer is smart enough to do things like identify index density, page density, uh, key density, and make corresponding decisions about what it's actually going to hit. So if we reverse this, again, that same worst case scenario, uh, we've got pages in table 2 plus rows in table 2 times pages in table 1. One of the things this spells out to us is that it's not necessarily uh, given which table we're going to start with. Also, we can see quite clearly from this specific example that the decision about what join order to take is going to have a dramatic effect on what the cost of the join is going to be. As in this case, it's 3 to 1. Now, when we start taking those numbers and multiplying them together, we can get all kinds of different values. Sometimes they're pretty close. Sometimes they're off by several orders of magnitude. Frequently, it depends upon what indexes we have going in each direction. We'll talk about that in just a moment. In the meantime, we see an illustration of the join order. One of the things that I will frequently do is set statistics I.O. on. When I set statistics IO on, it tells me how many passes it makes through each of the tables, as well as how many logical and physical reads I'm performing. So we can see that if we're uh, starting with the, at the top, we have table authors, scan count one, one pass through the authors table. Table two, title author, scan count 23. That's 23 passes through title author. This tells us that we're scanning authors once. That's the outer table. We're scanning title author 23 times. That's probably the number of rows in the author's table and the number of passes we have to make through title author. Logical reads, total of about 60. Second example, starting with the author's table, scan, uh, sorry, starting with the title author, scan count 1, two logical reads. Title author, scan count 25, logical read 63. So that one's 65 logical reads. Like I said, sometimes it's a very close thing. It may have to do with how well the indexes match. and what we're actually bringing back. So, from a performance perspective, the cost of this nested iteration or nested loop join is that the performance is going to be directly related to the number of times we perform the inner query. We will find frequently that the larger table needs to be the outer table. Depending on how you're indexed, that may be the table with the most hits 
and it may be that you've got the table with the better index on the inside. The server will make a lot of uh, evaluations. Uh, what's the bigger table? How would the indexes match? How many rows are we picking up from each side? Uh, do we have matching search arguments? Does the table fit into cache? Uh, we will also make assumptions about how much of the I.O. is logical and how much is going to be physical. Now, when we first put this class together back in the mid-90s, uh, I had a fellow working for me who is at least as big a geek as I am, possibly a bigger geek. And what he did was he said, you know, Jeff, uh, what we really need to do is add an example of calculating what the join order is uh, based on a bunch of different index options. And I said, that's a great idea. Go for it. So he put this example together, and I just want to give, the, give him credit. Uh, did a nice job of putting the information there, performing the calculations, uh, identifying the joins, uh, specifying a condition. And what we started with was, let's assume we've got no indexes. We're just doing a straight join. Uh, also, back at that time, the optimizer used a 2 to 18 ratio. It said a logical read is going to cost 2 milliseconds, a physical read is going to cost 18 milliseconds. These numbers are crazy out of date. However, the ratios are interesting because the server uses similar ratio right now to continue to calculate this, even though the disk is probably about 100 times faster, and the memory is probably about 100 times faster. So where it says seconds or milliseconds, ignore that, but take the numbers as relative numbers as opposed to absolutes. And as we start looking at this, identify that, well, the direction in which we join is going to have a very significant effect on what we think the cost is of the query. Once we did this, uh, my, my friend uh, slash associate uh, said, you know what? We've done this for one example. We should probably take all the possible join orders and indexes and plug those in as well. And we used to do that. We had those as addendums to the backs of the book. I don't think anybody ever looked at them, so we finally tossed those out to avoid throwing the paper away. Remember, this is a uh, paper class that we were doing, or, or rather a, 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 a full a classroom session that we're doing. But what we see here is that based on how well we're indexed, what the join order is, it can be an incredibly dramatic difference in terms of the amount of time it takes to resolve a join, from 12.5 million page requests down to 12,000 page requests. Today, 12,000 page requests is probably sub-second. 12 million page requests, almost definitely not sub-second, even if you're running uh, on full solid-state disk and or if everything is cached. 